I, I want to do a brief introduction for what we're going to try to accomplish here, and then, uh, then I'm going to go to work. Uh, and I promised Mike that he didn't have to work very hard. Um, certainly, it's been a, a rare privilege to have Mike with us this week. Um, I think Young Chin's introduction this morning captured really not only his importance to us personally, but to the field. And um, but I thought it might be useful for us to spend some time getting to know not only the man, but also his work. And so I'm going to try to cover some things about his life and his work. And, but it, at first, it's going to be a, actually, I sort of thought this is a combination of inside the actor's studio, and this is your life, and um, something like that. But uh, this is, a, I'm going to start, but please, I hope you'll feel free to ask questions, to interrupt. Um, if we don't cover something the way you want, then go at it. Uh, Mike is perfectly capable of uh, handling himself, even in the face of this daunting crowd. Um, I should say something else. Uh, Professor Sir Michael Rudder sounds very fancy, uh, and it is, and it's certainly an honor that he well deserves. Um, he is certainly one of the most distinguished scientists in medicine, and certainly the leader in child and adolescent psychiatry. But for the next hour, hour and a half, think of him as our friend and colleague, someone where you can actually ask the questions that you've always wanted to ask. And don't be embarrassed about asking a question. The only dumb question is the un unasked one. And um, so please don't, don't hesitate to jump in and, and go for it. Before we go any further, if you have a mobile, put it on stun, vibrate, or whatever form you like. And I know some of you may have to leave at various points along the way. That's OK. We are not going to be offended. OK. So I would like to start, for me anyway, knowing someone's work is knowing them. And so I wonder if you could, and I, I know some of this, but I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your family, where you came from, how you grew up, how your life began, and how you got to the point of getting into medicine and psychiatry. OK, well, I come from a family of doctors. My father was uh, a general practitioner, but with a special interest in obstetrics, and then he went into public health. Uh, and my grandfather, his father, uh, was the same. And so I was born um, in the Middle East. Uh, so I was born in uh, Bramana, which is in the hills above Beirut. In those days, that was a protectorate uh, down in Palestine, although it wasn't called that at that time. And my father was running medical service there for a five year stint. And um, then when I was three, I was born there. Uh, let me go sideways just for one moment. One of the interesting curiosities about being is that by um, Lebanese law, I was English because my parents were both English and because birth was registered at the British consulate. But English law is exactly the same. American law is different. America doesn't recognize that. And you're the nationality of where you were born. So when I came as uh, an evacuee in uh, 1940 um, during World War II, um, there was a problem for coming uh, because there was a 40 year waiting list for anybody who was ever needs. Huh. And um, America, um, I recognized. As I uh, still do recognize, as extremely rigid and bureaucratic, and yet extremely good at finding ways around. <laughs> so, you, if you look up in the right place, you will find that there is an act of Congress that was passed for the sole purpose of allowing my sister and myself to come to America. I know of no other country in the 
world that would do that. Uh, <laughs> so that was a right okay. Well, let's get you back to the UK, but then let's talk a little bit about the evacuation and, okay. and why and how the circumstances. Why were your parents in, in uh, Lebanon? My father was running the medical service there, so he was running it, well, curiously, by, for the um, American French Service Committee. Uh, so he was an employee of America at the time, <laughs> and America didn't recognize uh, the birth. And then you returned to England, in, and you were three years old? Maybe? Three years old. Uh, and lived happily until? Well, um, my father then um, went back into general practice, um, and uh, so that was in Wolverhampton, which is in the Midlands, um, and then um, in 1940, um, it seemed certain that Hitler would in back. Of course, Hitler never did. Um, but there was a period when it seemed that he would. And the general view is that the world would never be the same again. And so there was an initiative uh, of children going to um, the United States and Canada uh, for the war years. Um, and so I went on that initiative. Uh, and uh, on the Duchess of Athol, the name of the boat. Um, and the boat after the one I was on was torpedoed and sank with total loss of life. And so it then came to an end. And so the period of evacuating children to North America, uh, Canada, uh, stopped. And you spent the war living in Moorestown, New Jersey, um, with an American family who had never met my parents, uh, but who had friends in common. So um, they they did, I have to say, an absolutely stupendous job of keeping alive my parents in our day-to-day -day conversation over supper and washing up or whatever. Um, although they didn't know, um, they had letters. The letters were written once a week, but of course with the vagaries of the mail during the war, they came in bits and pieces. Um, and so, although I know people always find it peculiar when I say it, but it is true that for all that four years, I never felt separated from my parents. I simply had two families, an American family and an English family. And um, I'm not quite sure how they achieved that, but they did. And so it was not a stressful experience. I had a very happy four years, actually. Um, and they did a great job. Um, and what did I gain from that? Well, Certainly I gained a love for America and Americans. They were very kind, very good. And I learned, if you like, that I could go to a different place and be at home. Uh, so to jump ahead in, uh, a bit, um, I knew that if I had to leave it, because England was in such a parlous state that I, I certainly have no difficulty going to the States. Um, what I lost, if you like, is that I have no hometown. The concept of a hometown means nothing to me. Um, uh, until I came to my present place of work, I'd never lived longer than four years anywhere, usually much less than. Um, my accent is not English, but equally it's not American. So um, there was a site visit I was doing years later, and I was aware that the psycholinguist who uh, was on visiting the same research unit 
staring me at me. my time. And she said, I pride myself uh, on knowing from accents exactly where everybody comes from. I have the faintest notion where you come from. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I feel I speak perfect King's English, but I, I know English don't drive that way, and Americans don't die. So it's a, it's a curious amount. So what was it like for a seven-year-old boy to get on a boat and go to a new world? What were you told, and how would you? Well, I was told um, the straightforward sort of story, um, and um, I went on literally on my uh, birthday. Um, and how did it feel? Well, it felt that I was a responsible young adult looking after my younger sister. Now, of course, the reality was that there was a, an adult looking after all of us, and it wasn't just me. But um, that is what I felt. Uh, so it is curious how you build up a picture, which is, is not only totally wrong, but it was seriously misleading. And during the war, clearly, Britain was in great danger. Were you aware that your parents were at risk? And and did you, how did you deal with that? I mean, there was a blitz and... Yes, um, but, you know, I was sort of aware of it, but on the other hand, it never developed into an invasion, so that in the sense of the relief that that hadn't happened. And my parents, I think, went, particularly my mother, went through period of great guilt feeling that I'd been sent away and I needn't have gone because it would have been perfectly safe to remain. And she blamed herself for that. I think there for a while I always said, you know, actually those are happy years. <coughs> um, the, um, I changed the course during that time. Uh, so I went a well-behaved English child, and I came back rather a bullied American adolescent. <laughs> um, and so on the night that I came back, uh, my mother's mother, my grandmother, um, was living with my parents at that time, and uh, she um, saw me, and my mother then went to me. Winfrey, do you think you've got the right one? <laughs> uh, were you able to convince her you were the right one? Yes. <laughs> so then, from there, you obviously went to school. Can you tell us how, you know, what your education was like and where you, how you ended up in psychiatry? Uh, yes. Um, at that time, um, my family were mainly medics or lawyers. Uh, lawyers being solicitors and buying lawyers, obviously. Um, and I guess those are the two things that I knew about. Um, and I knew that um, my father and grandfather particularly loved their work. Um, and were very good at it. Um, so I was going to join them in their general practice when I'd been to medical school. Um, and it was only during my period of medical school that I um, changed into thinking that actually I became interested in brain and mind. How did that happen? Uh, well, through two different things. One was reading Gray Walter's book, um, the EG scientist, um, and the other was doing um, electives in um, neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry. And then I decided I was going to do psychiatry. Um, 
Some of you would have heard the story I'm about to tell before, and I apologize for that. But for those who haven't, um, there was a turning point. And um, it was when I did an elective with Professor William Meyer Gross, who had been Professor at Heidelberg, very distinguished and a very nice man. And what he did was give you a patient from the back ward, you knew the patient's name, uh, and you knew their age, I suppose, uh, and that's all you knew. And you had one hour to interview the patient, and then you would present the case to the United Gross. And I couldn't make head and tail of this patient, and uh, I couldn't get a proper history, um, I couldn't get an account of anything, and um, so I decided I better come out straight. And so I said, I'm sorry, Professor Margaret, I have failed you completely. Uh, I, I've had my hour, I have no idea what's the matter, and it's been a total waste of time. And he said, well, let's see. Take me through what you saw, what you observed, what you discussed. And um, in the course of doing that, he was able to show me that I had made all the relevant observations for making what in those days was called hebephrenic schizophrenia, I with thought disorder. And, uh, he converted a humiliating failure into a pseudo-success. A pseudo-success, of course, because I didn't recognize what I was seeing. Um, it was wonderful teaching. Um, and I subsequently went back to him many times for uh, advice. And um, it was he who said that uh, I had to go to Maudsley. But he said, first of all, I must get broader training uh, in uh, medicine, in urology, in neurosurgery, um, and pediatrics before doing that, which is what tended to happen in those days. Um, and so I did do that. Um, and it's been useful ever since, I have to say, both in my research and my clinical work. So I think you couldn't do this nowadays. Because nowadays you sign up for training in whatever specialty it is. And to go along to a selection committee and apply for a job in, shall we say, neurology, and say that it, it is on the way to becoming a psychiatrist, oh well, goodbye. Then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think that's just wrong. Um, but then he said I had to go to the Morty because that was the only place in England at that time that provided top class training. Um, it wasn't quite the case then, but it nearly was. Um, and I hesitated a while because I knew that I would have to do research if I went to the Morty. And I thought I knew that A, I would hate research, and B, I'd be no good at it. Um, but however, he knew me better than I knew myself, and actually I love the research and was reasonably good at it. Um, and one lesson from that was that he and Aubrey Lewis, who was the um, head of the at that time, um, was very good at knowing what you would be good at. He decided, Aubrey that is, um, that I should do child psychiatry. And that had never occurred to me. We had at that time only one day's training in child psychiatry as part of general training in psychiatry. And that was the one and only day in my medical school training when I was all sick. I never had um, And um, so he made various suggestions, um, uh, including things within the UK, all of which were good and all of which I did. Um, but he said that I had to learn about development and that um, to do that, 
I needed to go to America. And he made various suggestions as to where I wanted to go, none of which appealed to me greatly. Until her birch, uh, I don't know how many of you probably don't know about her birch. Um, he was a polymath, right, uh, Aubrey. Um, and he trained initially um, as a comparative psychologist, uh, working with uh, gurus and orangutans. Um, then he decided to go through medical school uh, while a, a full professor in psychology. And uh, he said he only did that because by the regulations at the time, doctors were the only people who could double park in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I think there were other reasons. His research in, was involving abnormal psychology and he felt he needed And um, so um, I worked with him and with Alex Thomas and Southern Chess. And between them, they knew anybody who was anybody in the United States. And so put me in touch with people like Andy Grunberg, Ben Pathomatic, Lee Robbins, uh, Ed Ziegler, um, Jerry Cable, and so on. And um, that was a huge thing. How long were you in New York? Uh, for a year. Uh, and what year was that? That was in 61, 62. Um, and um, Herb was special in a million different ways. Um, and I went on some. Um, side visits with him um, and he had a genius for listening to people in terms of what they were doing, what they were interested in and the course of talking about it would transform it into something that was much better but in terms of what they wanted to do. He was a wonderful listener um, and he was genuinely interested. And I saw that more later when uh, we kept in touch and he would come and visit us maybe once a year and um, would talk with my children who were really young and um, he talked to them like a fellow adult, using appropriate language, uh, but treating them as equal. He would remember a year later the name of their pets, what they did, what their interests were. They had never met an adult like that. Um, so he, he had this immense ability to be genuinely interested in other people um, and, and yet uh, be able to build on that way. So, in many ways, he was profoundly egocentric, but uh, that sounds as if that means that he wasn't interested in other people, and that would be totally wrong. He was very interested in other people in a very understanding, warm way. So, I love the way. What, what was your first research project? My first research project, um, well, with working with the New York Longitudinal Study, I suppose the first one was interviewing uh, twins. So that was my first introduction to genetic nanotherapy, a small sample. Um, nobody would publish it nowadays. Um, how big, how big a sample was it? Oh, a dozen or something. Um, but it was very interesting. And, um, you know, I did the usual sort of things. In those days, it was, you know, we had DNA, we had uh, fingerprinting, so I went out of fingerprinting. Um, and um, 
I learned also that the difference between um, <coughs> temperamental style and psychopathology. And I remember one twin uh, who had actually um, separated monozygotic pair. Um, and I had been there the previous visit, then I came again, and a little girl, who by then I suppose was maybe three, maybe no more than that, greeted me at the door and said, guess what? I had them all up last night. And so she was somebody with a very irregular rhythm, um, and, uh, and this had led to quite a disruptive style in the home. A twin sister whom I didn't see until much later was in identical twin uh, temperament, uh, but it was all dealt with in a matter-of-fact sort of way. Um, so it was a style of interviewing which I learned a lot from. Did it show anything uh, of current interest? No, probably not. But it got me interested in twins. Mm -hmm. At the time, at the time, at the time, you were quite. It, there was a lot going on in England that may have been somewhat different from what you were interested in Bowlby and, and Anna Freud. And um, did you ever interact with them? And and how? Uh, and how did the kind of your kind of view of the world sit with them or them with you? Okay, well, so we're talking now, let me sort of put a date on it, um, sort of late sixties, early seventies. And um, uh, Bowlby, I I never knew him well, but I met him several times. Um, and we got on okay. We differed on various things, but it was, um, he never saw me as a hostile critic. His followers did, but Bowlby was interested in data, and he was quite unusual in the sense that uh, the group that he put together when uh, writing his trilogy on attachment included um, ethologists like um, Robert Hind, um, experimentalist, I mean, a very diverse range. Um, I don't even remember whether there was another psychoanalyst in his group or not at that time. Um, anyhow, he, he was very broad range. And he did a study a little bit after looking at children who had a long stay in a sanatorium and found that the results were much better than he had predicted. And he changed his views uh, as the base, on the basis of the findings. So I respected him. Um, and the book was influenced, however, by somebody different as well. And that's Robert Hunt, who I knew slightly, but only slightly. So I sent him a very early draft of the manuscript for what was later the term of deprivation they assessed qualities of parenting in this country. And um, it was sort of a bit presumptuous that he was paying attention, but he did pay attention and I got back a detailed critique. I remember it as 17 pages. Uh, it may not have been 17 pages, but it was long. Said some positive things, but then pointed out uh, ways in which I needed either to put in uh, animal work that I hadn't considered, or alternatively interpret it in a different way. Hugely helpful. Um, and I certainly learned a lot on what you could do with animal models from that. He's a wonderful he's still alive, um, although long since retired, 
scientist, uh, a question. And um, just to take that as a jumping off point, um, I gathered over this period um, a series of mentors, none of whom supervisors. And uh, it irritates me that people sometimes see supervisors and mentors as the same. They're not the same. Um, and so I would count as my, among my mentors, um, Aubrey Lewis, of course, um, uh, Jack Tizard, George Brown, um, Leon Hermelin, um, Robert Hyde, Lee Robbins, um, and I thought later um, what was distinctive about them. And I realized they were all iconoclasts. And um, I guess it made me an iconoclast uh, too. So Jack Tizard uh, once asked him, the unit was made up of people he had hired before they had completed their PhD. And, uh, or sometimes even before they'd started their PhD. So they were all before they'd accomplished anything. And um, I don't know how he did it. And I certainly have not had the same success. I made some good appointments, but spotting people as early as that, I would. Anyway, Aubrey thought for a moment or two. And he said, well, People have got to be bright, but I take the awkward ones the others won't have. <laughs> and yet, I wasn't very pleased with that as an answer. Uh, but then Aubrey went on to explain that he wanted people who would challenge the wisdom of the moment and have the skills and creativity to do so in a way which would be productive. Uh, and that would be true of all the people. I've mentioned, um, and I guess I learned a lot uh, from that. And I see mentors as something that is very important for young people in the generation. You've been a mentor to many, we'll come to that in a moment. Stefan, you had a question. I did, yeah. Um, <coughs> you, you were touching on the. That's a proper English accent. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're touching on those twins you saw. I presume these are the ones from your 1977 paper with, um, with uh, false Stephen Rutter paper. No. No, no. Oh, no, no. Long before. Long before that. Oh. Well, so when I was, uh, I was looking at that paper, and of course you get a very high estimate of heritability there. Um, and you're looking at autism when it's at an instance probably 50 fold different from what we would now cite. If, and, and of course, nowadays the heritability estimates seem to be somewhat lower. But I'm wondering if you if you sort of cast your mind back to those, I think it was 21 uh, twin yeah. families, thinking about uh, the now the perception of the broader autism phenotype, that higher incidence. How, firstly, how diff how unique do you think the programs were, and with the unaffected, do you think if you were assessing them today, do you think you might draw different conclusions about? whether they were un completely unaffected or maybe on a broader phenotype? Well, that's a good question. It gets me onto tricky ground. Um, um, let me plunge in. Um, firstly, um, the question as to our sampling, mm -hmm. um, we could test because we did a total population survey through the collaboration with pediatricians and psychiatrists, child psychiatrists all over the country. When we did it at a later time uh, with um, Anne Lakuta and Tony Bailey and Co. And we found we missed hardly anyone. Yeah. Uh, so I feel confident that the sampling was as complete as it could be. Now, the sampling is, of course, in terms of a traditional concept of autism did not include in those days the broad autism phenotype. Um, and uh, does that matter? Well, it does and it doesn't. Um, the, what 
uh, we did look at that is, um, I've forgotten what term we used, but at any rate, we looked at features which involve cognitive and social abnormalities, but, for, but at a degree that was well short uh, of the traditional diagnosis. And um, we found that that shared the same genetic liability as autism proper uh, and was equally uh, heritable. Um, now, why is, am I moving on to dangerous ground? Well, because there are those who uh, have wanted to argue uh, that the estimate of heritability uh, was wrong. Um, I'm talking about Holmeyer, mm -hmm. um, who's not here, who's not, not that far away. Um, and so with a colleague, uh, Fruiting Reitzig, a statistician, um, we did a meta-analysis uh, looking at all the twin studies that use um, proper sampling. Mm -hmm. And what we show is something really very interesting. Uh, to begin with, um, what we show is that the uh, findings uh, do replicate the, and the claim by Helmer that there was a large environmental component was an artifact uh, of setting a prevalence rate that was ludicrously uh, out of step. And then if you varied it, you could put the environmental component up or down. Um, now it's obvious when you think about it that that will happen. Um, but I hadn't quite realized what the big difference it made. Why does it make a difference? Well, because the heritability, the, the, the agreement between the monozygotic pairs is so high that if you change the heritability, uh, change the prevalence rate, you can't go much higher. Whereas um, with dizygotic pairs, you can. And so what this showed is that uh, this was an artifact. Uh, because uh, 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 Holmeyer was basing it on the concept of the broader autism phenotype, uh, but estimating a prevalence rate which was completely out of keeping. Mm -hmm. um, now, I don't know why he did that. Um, I've never met him. Well, that's not quite true. I have met him once, but I don't know him. Um, so I feel that those findings are solid. Uh, the, what the heritability is exactly, um, you know, mm -hmm. there's confidence interval, yeah. which is substantial. We're talking about a, a heritability, though, that is certainly about 50%. Uh, whether it's as high as we originally found it, uh, I doubt. Um, but it's probably in the order of 70% or something. Do you recall if those if the probands have features like um, a low IQ, seizures, dysmorphic features? The things which might indicate a delayed mutation, for example. Uh, uh, no. Um, well, some have epilepsy, of course. Uh -huh. um, but. Um, did we exclude those with obvious anomalies? I, can't, I think we did. I'd, I'd have to look back. But what was very striking was that within concordant monozygotic pairs, the variation on those other features mm -hmm. was extraordinary. So there's one uh, pair that I've actually seen several times uh, who are very similar, then they're, they're concordant, both clearly have autism as traditionally diagnosed, but there's a 50 point IQ difference between them. Mm -hmm. 
and so and there is on other features as well. Mm -hmm. um, but it's sort of easier to deal with it in terms of IT because it's sort of quantified in a straightforward sort of way. Mm -hmm. So what we have to take on board is that within narrowly diagnosed autism, there is still amazing heterogeneity. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that mean uh, that it was a mistake to remove subdivisions of autism in DSM-5? Well, no, because the ones were based on criteria that didn't work. Mm -hmm. So I think it was right, but uh, we know that autism is heterogeneous. I mean, the association with tuberous sclerosis, fragile X, make that clear, uh, quite apart from the rare <coughs> um, The trick is that we have still to show what are the phenotypic features that index that heterogeneity. Yeah. That has yet to be done. Clearly, that is a soluble problem, but it hasn't yet been solved. So maybe I could twist this back. We'll come back to autism in a moment. But as early as the mid-1960s, you started writing about classification and nosology. Yeah. Um, uh, I was actually struck by a paper that you actually included Serge Lubavitchi on it. Um, uh, and along with Leon Eisenberg, um, uh, which was an interesting combination right there, where you talked about classification. And we're, tell me about your thoughts about classification and phenotyping in the contemporary sense, in, in, up to and including even your work on the instruments related to autism. And where have there been the successes, where are the failures, and what do you think comes next? Okay. Good and question. You can do that in about. <laughs> well, I can't resist no. um, starting with an anecdote, uh, which was the meeting in Paris, uh, WHO meeting, uh, dealing with the uh, preparation for, I guess it was DSM-3, yeah. um, and so in the usual way, uh, went round the table when you introduced yourself and said, well, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I will probably have said something or other that I'm a child psychiatrist, I have a particular interest in epidemiology and longitudinal studies, and I'm the next person. Sitting opposite me, the, it's a U-shaped table, uh, at the other end was Leon Eisenberg. And between me and Liam, all the people said, I'm this, that, and the other thing, and I'm a psychoanalyst. And then I said, I'm this, that, and the other thing, and I'm a psychoanalyst. Leon, who is a wonderful guy, uh, uh, important mentor to me, but also became a close personal friend, has a mischievous streak, as anybody you know, who knew him and the home will recognize. And so Leon said, I'm this, that, and the other thing, and I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> and it took roughly 10 years uh, for the French to forgive Leon. <laughs> <laughs> they saw this as an insult to France. It wasn't as an insult to France. It was just Leon um, twisting the tail. What... Um, these were based on case histories, and um, which is the way it was done in those days. Um, and one of the important things that came out of that was that we had one case where um, the a third of the participants diagnosed autism. Third diagnosed mental retardation and a third diagnosed <coughs> organic brain syndrome. And it's clear that the child had all three of those. And uh, yet, yeah, they agreed closely if you talk to them about it. Uh, and yet, they 
put them in different boxes. And that's what led to a multi called classification. Uh, I don't say it's the only thing, but it, it played a key role. And that has sort of influenced the way I thought about classification in recognizing that we need to have ways of encompassing that in the way that we deal with it. It's um, it was published by the Mental Health Union because WHO is not allowed to publish things that go against their overall rules. The overall rule is you can't have a multi-axial writing thing. Um, did it matter? No. Clinicians liked it. Um, and because it was more like what you do clinically uh, in dealing with psychosocial factors, uh, um, somatic syndromes, uh, and then the psychopathology. Um, and that, I think, um, has led me to be on the one hand um, very positive about the need for classification um, because there have been many times I thought, because I sat on various committees for a while, why am I wasting my time doing this? And then I thought, well, for all its demerits, which are many, classification is a passport to services and classification shapes the way you do research. So you have to pay attention to it, and the challenge is to do it well. Uh, uh, but to do it in a way which uh, recognizes the uncertainties involved. So Steve Hyman, who of course played a key role in all of this, uh, on one of his papers, wrote about psychiatric diagnoses as being um, a transiently useful fiction. I thought that's a wonderful phrase. What he meant was that for the time being, we need these diagnoses because we've got nothing better to put in their place. But they should not be reified. They don't exist in a way which is independent um, and that this means that they will change as new research comes in. Now whether there will be a DSM-6 involving a total re-go of the classification, I doubt. What we need, I think, is a way of accommodating new research coming in which tells us this thing is changing. You know, there are a lot of things that don't, so let's not set up this enormous, expensive machine. Who will decide that? How will that be decided? I don't know. But it will have to change. Um, there was a lot of hope, as you will know from reading the materials that led up to DSM-5. First of all, that DSM-5 would be dimensional, not categorical. Nobody could agree on how to do that, so that died of death. Um, and um, that there is a real danger, which Ken Kendler has emphasized particularly, of reifying things. These, these are not diseases in an independent sense. Uh, and that we shouldn't believe that. We shouldn't reify them at this day and this day. And uh, I'm not sure that he put that in that particular paper of his, but it sort of implies that if for research you need to do it a different way in order to test something out, do that. Don't pretend that it's using DSM-5 if it's not, but don't be afraid of doing it a different way if that's what the research demands. So I think we need to have this kind of, if you like, hypothesis system.
I want to shift gears slightly. You, you, if I, as I've read your papers, they cover the entirety of developmental psychopathology, ranging from psychosomatic disorders to neurologic disorders to uh, schools to ADHD, and I could go down the list, but um, and including uh, risk resilience and coping, I suppose, which is really important as well. But uh, treatment, depression, um, and you've written books on almost every one of those topics, as well as uh, a fair number of papers. I want to focus on just a few areas. I want to start with epidemiology, and in particular the Isle of Wight study, which was clearly pivotal in the development, not just of child psychiatry, but of psychiatry as well. And could you tell us how that got started, and and how what was your involvement, and what do you think the good news was, and what were the problems? Okay, well that's an important and interesting question, and I have to begin, as it were, by saying it couldn't happen today. Um, firstly, um, it started by the Department of Education approaching Jack Tizard, who then brought me in, so meeting the two of us, asking whether the findings of Cyril Bird in his epidemiological studies in a century ago uh, that um, educational problems were so frequently associated with uh, other sorts of pathology. Does that still hold? And so what Jack said to them was, yes, that's investigatable. We can certainly do that. But this is an opportunity uh, to do two other things uh, at the same time. Uh, one is to use the epidemiology in order to plan services. And secondly, uh, an opportunity to study uh, risk and protective factors for psychopathology. What about uh, putting together like that? It was not tied to a policy question, which is why it would not got funded now. I mean, that is allowed. Um, but um, Kingsley Whitmore, who was the senior medical officer who came in, was seconded part-time to work on the study, and there's a recognition that research should provide information that is useful for policy, but is not necessarily, in fact, not usually testing the policy question. And so it was a very exciting uh, study. Um, what we had was a team of people, almost all of whom had been trained either if they were psychologists by Jack Dizard or Phil Yule, uh, or if they were psychiatrists by Philip Graham or myself. Um, and they would come down to the island um, and got paid a modest honorarium, I don't remember what it was, but it was modest, um, for a period of a minimum of two weeks uh, and some stayed longer than that. And we would um, meet, you know, we took over one hotel um, and we would uh, meet in the evening and go through what had happened during the day, um, check reliabilities, check all sorts of things. Working very much as a team, um, one of the things that we insisted upon doing was interviewing children. And at that time, the wisdom of the day was, it was a waste of time asking children uh, because they wouldn't know enough to understand. And we said, well, I don't think that necessarily be the case if you do it in the right sort of way. So we did it. Um, and it certainly proved immensely useful. Um, and several things came out of it. Firstly, we showed huge overlap among the various sorts of disorders. Um, the um, uh, the findings on reading uh, led to 
an intervention study to try and um, remedy breathing difficulties of a severe kind at an early point uh, using a randomized controlled trial. Uh, went on to look more broadly at a larger population uh, to look at neuroepileptic uh, disorders, um, which showed, um, amongst other things, that the risk of psychopathology was not a function of handicap, um, was a function of organic brain dysfunction. So, for example, uh, children with epilepsy had a particularly high rate of psychopathology, although they had no physical handicaps, as you can see. Um, the, the working together of the team was tremendously exciting um, and that one was interviewing both the children and for that matter the parents blind to everything else was an interesting challenge because you don't normally do that in clinical work so you know that this was um, Peter or Mary whatever was, and that's it and you had half an hour uh, to do an assessment and come up with some ratings of this, that, and the other thing. I think we all found that a very interesting challenge. Um, you're used to having a lot of other information, but not having it, and to do it cold um, with a very useful training experience. Um, the study led on <coughs> to the further question, though, as to uh, whether the findings on the Isle of Wight um, would be the same uh, in inner London. And um, uh, so we did a comparative study then, uh, finding, in fact, that the rate was much higher in London than the Isle of Wight and that this was not a function of selective migration. Um, and that, in turn, led on to the school study. Which was my next. Ah! So tell, the, uh, tell us about the school study. And, and I think the school study is one of those studies that you would argue led to surprising findings for you. Yes, that and the remaining study are the two studies that I probably uh, enjoyed most because of the unexpected. So let's talk about the first let's talk about the school study. How it was conceived and what happened and why, how you were surprised. Okay, well let me tell you about the beginning. We had a practice then, as we had done throughout, of feedback to the people who'd helped us with the study. And so we had a meeting with the head teachers uh, and some other teachers uh, about what we found on the uh, and uh, one of the things we found was that although we were focusing on families, that's where we were sort of coming in, we happened to have noted immense variation in the schools, both on rates of problem behavior and the reading difficulty. And there's this lady in the fifth row um, who gave me one hell of a time uh, about all of and um, I thought, you know, I've, I've got a real hostile critic here. Um, but I was wrong. I could not have been more wrong. Because after the meeting, she came up to me and said, you cannot leave the findings there. We, as teachers, have to know whether the differences we are seeing in our schools is a function of the intake schools or what we do as teachers. What I propose is we set up a joint planning group of teachers and researchers to take this forward and we will take it through the unions if we be of her otherwise. And so once I got over my shock at finding that she was um, 
had very strong support, but did not want to support until she was convinced that what we had got was meaningful findings. She did better than her word, because in the middle of the survey, comparing the schools, um, there was a teacher strike um, about paying conditions, the European sort of thing. And so she and her fellow teachers met and decided that uh, we will of course abide by the strike uh, so far as all teaching activities are concerned because there are important issues at stake. But we will make an exception of doing what is needed for the survey. And that is because it is important to us. So despite the strike, she was as good as her word. The collection of data went on uninterrupted. Uh, so the cooperation there between practitioners, in this case teachers and researchers, was just a wonderful experience. I mean, it, we gained a lot from it uh, in all sorts of ways. Uh, I dealt with it in terms of planning, but in terms of the interpretation of findings. Um, it was also. So what were the surprises? Where were you surprised? <laughs> um, or where were you wrong at the beginning? <laughs> well, to begin with, um, the, the differences were bigger than I had anticipated. Um, so much so that England's most eminent educational statistician sent a memo around to every department of psychology and education in the country saying that these findings are rubbish. It could not be true. Um, an extraordinary thing to do, um, not a nice experience, but he was wrong. And in private, he recognizes that not only was he wrong in his judgment, but he was wrong to send that letter. Um, so that was one uh, thing. Um, the finding that the class size, the average class size, was unrelated uh, to differences in pupil outcome was a bit of a surprise. Um, and one of my most frightening experiences was um, having to talk to, I don't know what you, what do you call the Union of Teachers in this country? Well, American Federation of Teachers. American Federation of Teachers, okay. So there's about 2,000 of them now giving this talk to them. Now, well, I'm going to be torn limb from limb um, uh, on this class size thing. And I could not have been more wrong. What they said is, we welcome this finding uh, because what it does is give us freedom to use the good data from other studies, as well as yours, that although the average class size doesn't matter, the younger children do need a smaller class size, and children with special needs need it. So what you have done give us the freedom to provide the resources where they're needed rather than worry about some statistical error. And I thought, that's exactly what we hoped might be said. But I have to say the English teachers didn't speak up as quickly. They were very supportive of the findings. It was the um, it was the academics who were critical. Um, because in those days academics were very left wing and they were worried that in saying schools could be improved we were delaying the revolution and well, that was their problem I think, not mine. Can we move on to Romania? Yeah. And how did that come to pass? And, and and what did you learn from that that was surprising? 
Well, it came to pass because um, when the Ceausescu regime fell, uh, there was a lot of TV coverage, some of you have seen some of this, of the appalling conditions in the orphanages there, and that a number of the children were being um, adopted from the UK now. And they said, as to say the Department of Health as well as this time, that we have no idea what's going to happen to them. And even worse, we have no idea what to do. Can you do a study uh, which can trace the children and uh, investigate what the outcome is? And so they said, we will have a go. So they found a pilot study, uh, could trace them, could gain their cooperation. would be able to show some of the uh, outcomes. The findings um, were surprising in umpteen different ways. It take far too long to go through all of them, but let me mention just a few. Um, firstly, um, the, we found no increase in the average, uh, not the average, the common varieties of emotional and behavioral problems, unless they were associated with what we came to call uh, deprivation-specific patterns, quasi-autism, disinhibited attachment, and so on. Um, now that ran right against what was supposed to be done. Um, but that has held up. Um, we then found um, that the effects on head growth uh, were marked uh, and we focused uh, initially on the whole sample but then we looked at those who had spent all their pre-adoption life in the institution and not had sub subnutrition, that's to say their, their caloric, caloric intake was enough for their weight to be up to uh, norms. And um, they showed uh, two things that are, are of interest. Uh, one is that um, if you looked at pure psychosocial deprivation, i.e. without subnutrition, um, the uh, head growth is about three standard deviations below. So this was a very clear indication that there were major biological uh, effects. Second finding was that unlike the group who were subnourished, where they were small from the word go, uh, the findings on the pure psychosocial group only were apparent <coughs> in those who were in institutions longer than six months. So it seemed as if, as it were, it took a while for the effects to kick in. But when they kicked in, they were severe. Now, the implication of that is that um, there is some kind of critical period there. Um, now, whether that is the right cutoff for it, um, I'm not sure about. So Chuck Nelson and Nathan Fox and Charlie Zena findings in their study uh, showed that it was a bit later than we had found. And I discussed that with them, and we both agreed that it's in the first couple of years, uh, but whether it's a time we found or a little bit later like they found, we don't know. Uh, but it is something that occurs early. Um, Deprivation-specific patterns were a surprise. Um, so the only reason we looked at autistic-like features was that by sheer coincidence, I happened to have referred to me clinically, nothing to do with research, two people who'd been in orphanages who showed what looked like autism. And so I thought, well, we better measure this. Um, and 
one of the uh, findings was how remarkably persistent these were. So that these um, were uh, persisting up to age 15, which was the last full-time survey. It's now been done again at 22, but I haven't got the results to hand on that. Um, <coughs> and it was associated with heavy uh, referrals for clinical services. So we're dealing here not with policy to behave, but with clinically important uh, problems. Um, do surprises. But each time we did a study, some of the things were confirmed, of course. Um, but there's some new things came up. And that's why I say advisedly research is addictive. It's addictive because you find out what you didn't know and what you may never even imagine. Um, confirming your findings, that's the boy. <laughs> I, I have one last question for you, then I'm going to stop and let everybody else ask whatever they want. In 1986 in JCPP, you wrote a paper that looked ahead 30 years in child psychiatry. It's 30 years. <laughs> um, is what you saw then what happened? And what do you predict for the next 30 years? And you've read that paper more recently than I. So, <laughs> so, so give me a gist. Well, I think you you expected us to have a more data driven approach to uh, and systematic um, uh, approach to classification and understanding disease, and you expect us to have more biological markers than, than for disorder. Okay. Which has been partly supported, but only partly supported, I think. Um, so that at that time, I think, like more or less everybody else, I assumed that um, with top rate researchers, and Tony Monaco, we certainly had a top rate researcher, found several genes, uh, uh, that it would be relatively straightforward uh, to uh, find the susceptibility genes for autism. And it has proved incredibly difficult. Um, so that's a surprise. The biological findings are more iffy than I expected, uh, as I touched on in my talk uh, earlier this morning. Um, what have we learned? Well, we have learned some very important things. Uh, one is that uh, each individual gene that we know is associated has a terribly small effect. And that, I think, is shown by all the studies uh, and is a very solid finding. Now, what do we do with that? that that's the tricky bit. One could say, one should give up genetic research, because if the findings show such terribly small effects, to very little clinical use, let's get on with something that we can handle. I don't say that, um, but I think what it does mean is that we've got to think anew to what we do with it because there is precious little in the way of um, clinical utility at the moment. And uh, so that, um, that one of the hopes for DSM-5 would be that it'd be based on neural pathways. <laughs> that proved not possible. Uh, and I would argue that we must work to make it more possible. But I would also argue that that should never be the only criteria. 
So let me give a concrete example. Um, we know from good genetic studies by Ken Kendall and others um, that uh, blood phobias are genetically indistinguishable from all the other kind of fears. But they, of course, differ in that they are accompanied by a fall of blood pressure, not a rise. And that matters. And so, <coughs> in that instance, I think we need to recognize that as something that does matter. You need to be safe here that. Yeah. Yeah. So where are we going to be 30 years from now? Some of these people will be sitting here 30 years from now. Mm -hmm. We won't be, but they won't be. Right, so I'm looking to them to be successful in finding the answers that we have failed so far to find. Uh, so I'm optimistic. <laughs> we have better tools at our disposal, and we have better concepts at our disposal than was the case 30 years ago. And in both cases, that's for real. Um, so I see all this as doable. Um, do I know precisely what that will show? No, I would not be so foolish as to even try. Uh, predicting um, five years is difficult enough. Uh, 30 years is impossible. Um, but I think that I would say two things. Uh, one is that um, um, we need to plan our education on the expectation that you are all going to have to do major new learning. The idea that that stops when you've graduated is just wrong. And it was wrong in my day when research was moving much more slowly than it is now, um, and it'll be even more wrong uh, in your day. Now, do I know what you will have to be learning? No, I don't know that. But just to take my own career, I've never been trained in child psychiatry. Uh, I've never been trained formally uh, in genetics. I've never been trained formally in epidemiology. So I haven't been trained in anything uh, <laughs> that is relevant. I would argue that I have gone to some considerable trouble to learn about all of these and that I have uh, worked with people who have taught me a huge amount. So, uh, but there will be things I haven't imagined in the future which will come on the horizon. You'll have to do it. So, um, the notion that our present miserable government in London uh, is fixated on as seeing education as teaching people facts, I deplore. Of course we have to learn facts. I mean, it, you know, we've got to be safe doctors psychologists or whatever we may be. But if that's all, <coughs> we're in the right trouble. Uh, and the second thing is that um, we need to um, we need to have a way of enjoying as well as being skilled at new learning. Um, is it challenging? Yes, it's enormously challenging because the range of things we have to do is growing all the time. But it is exciting times. Um, the, uh, <coughs> the message, I think, is, well, there's a cartoon uh, that shows somebody saying, um, be kind to your children because they will choose to care. Uh, and uh, 
I would say, get on well with your colleagues because they're going to be important to you in the work that you do. Mm. Almost always is collaborative these days. And I'm very fortunate in working in the center of the SDTP where there's an ethos of being helpful uh, to um, everybody. Whether you're an administrator or a scientist or a clinician, it doesn't matter. Uh, the job is not to say, no, it can't be done. The, the question is, give me a few minutes to think about it, and I will try and find a way when it can be done. And that's what it should be about. And we are just very lucky in having high quality people. But it is that excitement which makes it a place that people like to come to. Thank you, but do you have questions for Mike? <laughs> Don't be shy. Not anything. Or objections, if you think I'm <laughs> taking a totally wrong line. Or welcome. I, I will fight back, of course, but... Uh, <laughs> What are you most passionate about doing now? What are you excited about in your own work? That, um, is getting you up each morning. Okay, good question. Um, well, um, the thing that I have most recently completed um, with Andrew Pickles was we were challenged to do an annual review of threats to the validity of child psychiatry and psychology. And that, that proved an interesting challenge, and the paper's now online. Um, and I think it's a good paper. Working with somebody from an entirely different background and, and <coughs> a statistician uh, was, was good. Uh, did it have its ups and downs? It did, but we worked through them, and I think that was useful. It certainly got me thinking, and I think Andrew would say the same, that got him thinking about things <coughs> in a way from where we started. My collaborations over the years with Andrew, that's always been the case, but whatever our starting point, we both tend to change our minds during the course of, you know, here's, here's what I call a thinking statistician. <laughs> um, and Not all statisticians are. <laughs> what are some of the threats from the pandemic? Let me put those on one side for a minute and just say the other thing that I thought with, which was that I was asked by the Academy of Medical Sciences uh, to uh, run a working party looking at um, the ways of testing efficacy of drugs and the um, side effects with which they're associated. So I'm in the middle of that, um, but it's got a short time frame. It's all got to be complete by, uh, at the very latest, spring of 2016, so we only have a few months off. And that's certainly engaging. I mean, it, it's, it's proved more difficult than one might at first think. Um, so that when I agreed to take it on, I thought, well, this is reasonably straightforward. But it's not, actually. So that does engage me. Uh, so to come back to the threats, what, what threat? Well, firstly, there are two threats about which we can do little at the moment. Now, one is that if you compare with cancer, shall we say, we can't examine the tissues. So. Uh, genetic advances in cancer have made a huge difference to treatment and prognosis because the, you can study the genes of the cancer. <coughs> we can't do that in the brain. Um, so that's one. Um, one of the reviewers is insisting that that's not a threat, it's simply a modification. But Andrew and I said, no, hold on. This is a threat. Uh, it's not one we can manage. The other is that the classification system 
that is currently available to us is severely limited in many ways. The overlap among diagnoses, for example, um, and we can't control that directly. That, that of course, is essentially a soluble problem, but it means approaching diagnoses in a way that hasn't been done before. Um, but one of the several threats that we can deal with uh, is in terms of, firstly, um, the dangers of um, too flexible methods of data analysis. Um, so there's an interesting paper by uh, Simmons, I think, um, showing that this will inevitably lead to false positives. And it's that which led to the uh, consort and uh, stroke guidelines advocating pre-planned analyses. And if pre-planned analyses aren't possible, as they may not be, if, if your analysis shows something that is totally unexpected, you may want to have a rethink. But the rules still apply, and the rule is that you then have to specify why you want to do a different analysis, what analysis you're going to do, and how you set about it. So it can still be pre-planned, although it is, if you like, re-planned rather than pre-planned. Um, we are pointed to the problems of um, pressures from um, employing authorities, funding agencies uh, to claim a breakthrough. Breakthrough is rare as healthy and free. Um, and breakthroughs are the kind which mean the, the policy change should never be done on the basis of one study. You, you need multiple studies. Um, pressures on drug companies. We had a very good meeting with the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industries, who, to my delight, were very clear that it was important uh, to be upfront about the concealing of data in the past and ghostwriting. Does that still happen? Rarely, but it's not completely. And so those sort of biases need to be dealt with. And so there are various other things. Um, it's more upbeat than um, you might expect, in the sense that we do talk about um, the achievements. Um, I'm very keen that we don't start by gloom and despondency. Um, that, that there is a background of claims that we have lost trust because of the failures of reputation. And there is an interesting paper that came out oh, I think two weeks ago uh, in which they did a follow-up, five-year follow-up, I think it was, of uh, findings that hit the headlines and were clearly important. And what it showed is the first thing, half of them had never been replicated. Just, nobody sought to replicate them. Of those that had been replicated, only about 16% were confirmed. Uh, so there is a problem there. And so, we talk a bit about how one needs to deal with this, recognizing the reality that this has happened. It arises particularly uh, from uh, underpar studies with big findings. And one of the papers that we reference um, says, if you see a paper uh, based on a small sample with a bigger paper, the odds are that's a false positive. It could be for real, but history tells us that it's unlikely to be. Beware. Um, we are just about.
We're actually out of time. Um, I actually have four more pages of questions. This has been a precious hour and a half that's gone so fast. I can't thank you enough for indulging me anyway in the uh, opportunity to query you, but also for your candor and intimacy with this group. I think it's a, a moment in time and a privilege that none of us will forget. So I thank you very much. Thank you.